from a visual standpoint, modern malware is pretty boring. If you don't know what I mean, go check out some of the crazy stuff that came out of the 90s. But by being boring, it makes it much, much harder to spot, and it allows it to get away with being undetected for a much longer period of time. And Sis Joker, the latest bit of malware to make the news, sort of perfectly embodies that. This was discovered by researchers at a firm called Interzer back in December 2021, but just recently they published their report on it, detailing how it actually functions, and how it might actually be distributed. Now what this is, is a multi-platform remote access Trojan, or a backdoor, or whatever you want to call it. So, this being multi-platform, it runs on Windows, Mac, and also Linux. It's not a single version for all three operating systems, but it has been ported to all three. What makes this kind of dangerous is that both the Linux and the Mac versions go completely undetected by Virus Total. As for the Windows version, it is detected, but only partially. Now, the likely cause for this is the fact that none of the code seen in this malware has actually been seen in previous attacks. This malware is written completely from scratch. Now that this joker is known about and the samples are actually out there, the virus detection engines are going to be updated to actually detect this attack, but the early days of any attack like this are going to be kind of scary. Now, while I say this is multi-platform, it's not doing things like exploiting vulnerabilities in account management to do things Things like privilege escalation, for example. What it requires is the victim to actually be tricked into running it. Now, if you're a tech savvy user, this might sound kind of difficult, but for a lot of people, let's say you download a binary from some shady download site. Let's say you're trying to download a crack for an application, or maybe someone sends you a file through a compromised email address. These are all pretty easy ways to trick someone into running something. And then once it's running, Finding out how to stop it running is actually kind of difficult because what it does is masquerades as a system update or a core piece of system software. So on Windows, it'll run as IGFX CUI service, and this is actually the Intel common user interface, a perfectly safe file. So if you try to look up what that file is, you're not going to find anything besides, hey, this is safe just leave it alone. And it saves data in a file called Microsoft Windows.dll. On macOS, it's going to run as a file called update macOS. And then on Linux, it's called update system. The first thing it does when it starts running is grab some basic data about the system. Things like the Mac address, the username of the user, the serial number of the hard drive, the IP address. But this is the least malicious part of the entire attack. It then pulls down a list of command and control servers from a hard-coded Google Drive link and will turn this system into a node for this C2 server. It's likely this attack is still being actively monitored by the attacker. During the analysis by Interzer, the command and control server being connected to changed about three times. This indicates that they're attempting to circumvent detection by not having data flowing to and from the exact same location. Now, these C2 servers actually have kind of interesting domains. So they look fairly legit if you just take like a brief look at them. So let's say graphic-updater, winaudio-tools, uh, github.urlmini.com. So rather than GitHub being the actual domain, it is a subdomain. But if you see that just like briefly, you'll think, oh, it's just going to GitHub. Nothing to look at there. Now, when you're connected to this server, it will allow the server to issue commands to your system. Those commands being cmd, exe, exit and remove reg, with exit and remove reg not actually being implemented in the current version, but it's very likely going to be used to clean up the malware to make it so it just never seemed like it was on your system. As for CMD and EXE though, they are pretty straightforward. So CMD will tell the system to run a command and then send the response back to the server. EXE, yes, I know EXE is a Windows term, but that's just what we're using here. EXE will tell the system to download a file and then run the file, which is very likely to be some other form of malware, let's say ransomware, for example. And because it's just masquerading as a system update, you've already given it permission to run. So you're basically screwed. Now, currently the infection method is unclear. However, the executables they have in their samples have a .ts extension 
rather than the extension they are supposed to have. .ts, one of its uses being for TypeScript. So a possible infection method was through an infected NPM package. But .ts is also used for a video transport stream, so that's also entirely possible. What makes this much worse, though, is judging by the dates the command and control server domains were actually registered, this malware has likely been circulating since about mid-2021. And during the analysis of the malware, no second stage attacks were actually witnessed. The second stage attack would actually be running one of those commands from the command and control server. I'll leave a full link to the Intiza report in the description down below, but if you don't understand the basic flow of the malware, this diagram, this flowchart, whatever you want to call it, does a great job at actually explaining it. At least until malware detection engines actually start to deal with this, there is still something you actually do to mitigate the problem. That is getting rid of it manually. Now, where the data is actually stored really depends on which operating system you're actually on. This isn't going to be everything, but on Windows, generally looking under C colon program data slash recovery system or C colon slash program data slash system data is going to get most of the files. Also, to make sure it starts up on boot, it creates an auto run for IGFX CUI service, which launches that set application. On Linux, everything is going to exist under slash dot library. And to make sure it starts on reboot, it's going to create a cron job that just runs the application whenever the system reboots. And then on Mac OS, everything is going to be stored under slash library, not slash dot library. And it's going to be rebooted through a launch agent called comma.apple.update.plist stored in that same directory. But as I mentioned before, I do recommend reading the Intiza report because there is a full list of the command and control servers that are known about and the files and directories used on Windows, Mac OS, and also Linux, along with the commands that are going to be run. So if any of these commands are just running for seemingly no reason, you can put a stop to them and maybe it'll help you detect that something's actually going on. One thing to keep in mind with this article is Intiza definitely uh, took it as an opportunity to shield their software because their software right now is the only software that detects it and deals with it. So keep that in mind when you go into it, but ignoring those sections of the article, it is definitely still worth the read. At the end of the day, antivirus software is only going to get you so far. If you don't know what you're downloading, you're just downloading random applications. If you're just using unencrypted connections, if you just run anything that you see, nothing is going to save you. The best form of antivirus is common sense. Keep an eye on your system, know what's going on, and you'll generally be safe. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. And if you like this video, I'm going to go and like the video. And if you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe to the only bearer pay linked in the description down below. I've also got a gaming channel called Rory Robertson Plays and a podcast called Tech Over Tea. And that's going to be it for me. So... I'm out.